uh, yeah. we still have a very, very interesting speaker with us. I'll, I'll tell the story how I, I stumbled in Dr. Riley Moines. I was watching YouTube. I, I love YouTube, you know. I, and uh, I, I, I was uh, making a research about, uh, you know, the reinvention of retirement. And then I, I, I saw a, a TEDx speaker with almost uh, 3 million uh, views. And uh, the guy, you know, who is not a social entrepreneur, uh, is a business person, uh, wrote a very, very interesting book, which I recommend, which is The, the Four Phases of Retirement. Well, I could explain you in a nutshell here because I'm I'm talking about you know I, I he evangelized me with uh, his book and with his TED talk and then I invited him to come and to uh, to talk especially for the young baby boomers uh, who are in trying to make sense uh, on how they have to prepare. To retirement life, if they can, how they can reinvent themselves. So I'll give the floor to Dr. Riley Moines, please. Ricardo, thank you for inviting me and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to share some of the work that I've been doing for the last few years uh, with, with your group. Um, yeah, so everyone says you have to get ready to retire financially. And of course you do. But what they don't tell you is that you also have to get ready psychologically. And that's the area that has been of real interest to me. Uh, I think it's really important that people understand that there will be significant changes and challenges, psychological challenges that almost always accompany retirement. And I think that they can be understood uh, through a, a kind of a model that uh, over uh, a number of years I have uh, I've developed that uh, seems to make sense for many, many people. Uh, it certainly makes sense for me. And I've had a number of people say that it, uh, it, it makes good sense for them too. So uh, that's one thing that I want to share with you is, uh, is, is this model called the four phases of retirement. But I also want to make a point, if I may, before uh, I describe the four phases, and that is that in North America in particular, we are still, uh, in my view, kind of almost at the Neanderthal stage of retirement planning. It is 90%, if not more, all about investments and uh, have you got the right asset mix and do you have the right this and do you have the right that and, uh, and, and, and have you got your will in place and do you have your powers of attorney? Now, these are all critically important things for sure, no doubt about that. But what has been almost completely overlooked in the financial services industry in North America in particular, it's changing, but it's uh, we've got a long, long way to go. And that is that there needs to be a look at some of the psychological changes and challenges that come as well. And so what we're beginning to see is, a, is, a, uh, is some financial advisors who are also becoming certified as, as retirement coaches. And they're looking at a retirement from a broader perspective than they might have been in the past. So when it comes to uh, making retirement plans, one of the suggestions that I would make would be to uh, look for a financial advisor who not only is experienced in that area, but who also understands that there are other elements to uh, preparing for retirement. Uh, with that, let me, if I may, briefly outline the four phases of retirement as I have developed them and uh, see if they make some sense for you. Um, I believe that, that most people, and again, we're talking about, in my experience, in my research, 
about 80% of retirees. I, I know that there are two, two kind of subgroups that might not fit this pattern. And I realize that these are kind of broad strokes and that there are obviously there are exceptions to the rule, but kind of big picture. What I've discovered is that um, most people go through four phases of retirement. Uh, the first phase is what I call the vacation phase. And that is uh, exactly what you might expect from a term like that. It's kind of, uh, it, it, it's what you do when you're on a vacation. You have no set routine. You get up when you want and you go to bed when you want and you do what you want. And it's just a marvelous experience for a period of time. One of the things we like most about phase one is that there is no set routine. Um, and my experience is that for most people, this phase, phase one, represents their view of an ideal retirement. It's fun in the sun, it's, it's travel, it's all the things that you see uh, uh, through the advertising. It's just having fun, no worries whatsoever, it's freedom, it's wonderful. And it's a significant part of the, of the retirement uh, journey in my view. But what I've also discovered and certainly my experience was that after about two years, I got bored. Some people get bored sooner than that and others take a little bit longer, but it was almost like too much of a good thing is too much. And we actually do find ourselves bored because you can only do so much gardening or you can only do so much playing golf or you can only do so much traveling. And all of a sudden it just becomes not what you thought it would be. And so at that point, when people start asking themselves, is that all there is to retirement? They have now moved into what I call phase two, which is a phase where um, it's described as feeling loss and feeling lost. Um, what I've discovered in phase two is that most people suffer five significant, almost unavoidable losses that are directly associated with retirement. They lose their set routine. Now in phase one, we're happy not to have a routine for a bit. But there's something I believe genetically in us that requires us to have some sort of routine most of the time. When we retire, we lose that routine and that's a significant loss. We lose our identity. Men in particular identify with their work, with their profession, with their calling. And when that, when that is taken away, part of their identity is lost and it's a significant loss. We lose relationships. Many of the relationships that we may develop uh, during our working careers uh, it, are, are significant to us. Many of those folks may well become kind of lifelong friends. And when we retire, those relationships are generally lost. Fourth, there's a loss of, of a sense of purpose. And many, many people just get a real sense of purpose from their work, whether it's domestic or whether it's, whether it's outside the home, there's a real sense of purpose. And when that is finished, that aspect of their life is gone. And finally, some people acquire over a working career uh, some power and they may have power over a budget or, or personnel uh, or whatever it may be, but there's a sense of power. And when they retire, that too is gone. So we don't see these five losses coming, but they all come at us at the same time. And it's kind of like, bang, it's bang. It's, it's, it's traumatic for many people. So we suffer these five losses in phase two, but it gets worse because in addition to those five, <laughs> My God. yeah, but imagine. Uh, in addition to these five losses that are associated almost exclusively with retirement, we also face the three Ds. These are not associated directly with retirement, but more a kind of time of life. So we suffer some physical and mental decline. That just happens. We all know about that. We all know about that. The Mayo Clinic, the world famous Mayo Clinic, says that there is a 40% likelihood that when we retire, 
we will evidence signs of clinical depression. And the third D is divorce. Rates of divorce in North America have doubled for people over 60 since 1990 and have tripled for people over 65 since that same period of time. So taken together, this combination of the five almost unavoidable losses and the three Ds can be a very, very powerful and very disturbing time for people. In fact, in North America, as you probably are well aware, the highest rate of, of suicide is men over 75. So this can be a very difficult time and, and much of it is associated with retirement. Now, tied in with the fact that so many of the baby boomers are going to be living extended times in their retirement, perhaps 30 years or so, perhaps a third of their life, sooner or later, most of us come to the point of saying to ourselves or someone else, I can't go on like this. I do not want to spend the rest of my life, perhaps 30 years or so, feeling this way. And that's a good sign because that's when the rehab can begin. And by rehab, we move into phase three, which is what I call the trial and error phase. And in phase three, we start asking ourselves again, what, are this, what kind of contribution can I make? I've still got lots left in me. What can I do that's going to make me want to get up in the morning again? That's going to allow me to squeeze all the juice out of retirement. And so we begin to look for ways in which we can kind of re-engage and that we can do things that are going to be meaningful to us and give us a sense of satisfaction. But again, as I've discovered, it's trial and error. And it's unlikely that the first effort that we might make is going to be a successful effort. I have lots and lots of evidence of people who have tried this and that and it didn't work and they got frustrated. And in some cases, they just, thankfully, they just keep at it and keep pounding away until they discover something that is going to make them want to get up in the morning again. And my point is that most of us at some point do discover something or some things that are going to appeal to us. Maybe it's volunteering, maybe it's, it's whatever it might be. Uh, one of the people I interviewed was, is very, it loves the fact that he's delivering prescriptions from a, by a local drugs, from a local drugstore to people in the, in the community who just can't get to the drugstore, who, who need that kind of assistance. He gets tremendous satisfaction out of that. So that's the kind of thing that might be helpful to people. Moving to phase four, I estimate based on the work that I've done that only about 50 to 60% of retirees reach phase four, but those who do are among the happiest people I have ever met. These are people who have taken things that they know they do really well and that they love to do and that have led to success for them in the past. And they are applying some of those skills and abilities in different areas than they may have during their domestic or working career. So what they're, they're, they're not, they're, they're, they're offering service to people. And, and I agree with Bill that this idea of giving equals health. These are some of the healthiest, happiest people that I've ever come across. And they are giving, they are providing service to others. That's the, that's the underlying theme that I've discovered in phase four. It's providing service to others, maybe on a volunteer basis, maybe getting paid for it with some pocket money as my friend is who's, who's delivering prescriptions. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. But these people are committed to service to others. They're committed to lifelong learning. And, and so what they're not doing is retiring in the traditional sense. What they're doing is, and I love this term, they are rewiring themselves. They're using their skills and abilities and things that have led to success in the past, and they are maybe redirecting them to entirely different initiatives or ventures. They're rewiring. And there was another lovely uh, uh, phrase 
that was delivered by Serena Williams, one of the, one of the tennis uh, sisters. And she said that she's not retiring from tennis. She is evolving to do things, other things that she loves to do. And I love that phrase. So whether you retire or whether you prefer to call it rewire or evolve, to me, that's the whole concept of getting the greatest amount of satisfaction during this, as I say, may well be one third of our lives in retirement. So thanks for the opportunity to share this concept with you. And uh, thanks Ricardo for inviting me to be part of your organization and, and, your, and, and your initiative here this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, always inspiring, all, always a great speaker. And uh, you know, uh, there is one uh, image that uh, you use very often in your presentations that I think it's really striking, you know, is strong. The idea that uh, the baby boomers are, you know, are, are causing a tsunami of, uh, of retirement. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be even bigger than we think. When you look at China, for instance, right now, because of the demographic, the macroeconomics, uh, the demographics policy of China, uh, they are going to have in the in ten years ahead four four hundred million people above the sixty years old. The, the the retirement age in China it's very low. It's fifty five for women women and sixty four men. And I think they even can cause a social, uh, a sort of a social unrest if uh, we cannot find together, you know, how we are going to reinvent the retirement. How is, how are the models, you know, the new models for retirement rewiring, uh, evolving? What, what's it? But somehow we have to find out what all these people are going to do in the next 30 years of their lives. They just cannot sit down and do nothing. Exactly. Well, board step. I thank you very much all, you know, for this very inspiring conversation. And uh, please keep in touch with us because at uh, 50 plus chapter, we are going to carry on in this so exciting discussion. Thank you very much, thank Bill, you, Andrea, Riley, Chris on the Hill and Jiro. See you.